All right, welcome everyone to our next GOCC seminar. Today, Ariman Jal is gonna be telling us about polyhedral geometry of bisectors and bisection fans. Before we get started, I wanna remind you of our community agreement and the statements in there that we are all learning, everyone has something to contribute, and no one has all the answers, not even the speaker. Uh, and on that note, Ariman. You're welcome to get going. Thanks a lot, uh, Prairie. Thanks a lot to the GOCC organizers for having me. Uh, the title of my talk is Polyhedral Geometry of Bisectors and Bisection Fans. And uh, one point of the talk is to give you an idea of what uh, the structural theory of bisectors is uh, to describe this new family of fans, or rather uh, this new construction of a polyhedral fan and to give you some idea about uh, what it encodes or why it's useful and what other aspects of polytope, polytope theory it's related to. Um, so I'll start with, uh, so the setting is convex geometry. The setting is polyhedral geometry and uh, we're gonna start with centrally symmetric polytopes. So the idea for the bisectors part in, in the title, it, conjures up a familiar image, and that image is, is that of the Euclidean bisector. So uh, in that case, you have two points, the underlying distance is the usual Euclidean distance, and the set of all points that are equidistant to these two points is constructed by taking the perpendicular bisector of those two points. And uh, in higher dimensions, instead of having a line, you'll have a hyperplane. And with respect to the Euclidean uh, norm, that's that's all the complexity there is. To it. It's always a high. Uh, so the the question that that one could ask is that if you if you were to vary the underlying norm, if you were to change the distance function, what does the image look like then? What would this blue line look like if you change the distance function? If you change the convex body essentially. So I'm going to speak almost interchangeably when I say distance function and convex bodies. Convex bodies gives give rise to distinct functions, and uh, distance functions as a, a, like a function which satisfies uh, convexity and positivity and uh, symmetry. They, they give rise to centrally symmetric convex bodies in turn. So I'm going to speak interchangeably in terms of like, these convex bodies and distance functions. So, so this is the Euclidean case. A more complicated image would look something like this, and uh, on and uh, both these pictures sort of demonstrate the complexity of what a bisector could look like if uh, you vary the norm. And in this case, the norm is just the taxicab norm in, in two dimensions, where the yeah, where where the where the underlying convex body is uh, is a diamond, is this two dimensional cross polytope. So on on the one side, uh, on the left side, you have this two dimensional bisector. On the right side, you have a one dimensional bisector. So bisectors aren't even you know of a kind of predictable normal uh, dimension. Uh, in uh, on the left hand side, you have this you have this one dimensional piece which is sort of floating in the middle. It's not contained in anything. Uh, then you have these two dimensional cells out here. So there, in, so in the theory of bisectors, even in the two, in, even in two dimensions, the the idea is that you know sort of more pathologies can occur than you know than normal things. So uh, this is one uh, instance of that that the fact that the that the dimension um, uh, is not easily predictable, and this is an image we sort of return to. Uh, there's a reason that you know I've I've drawn this dotted line uh, through A and B, and uh, there's uh, there's a point to consider over here, which is that uh, these two cases, the one over here, the presence of just you know these three lines together, and over here, the presence of these two two-dimensional cells, is very dependent on the relative position of A and B to you know the structure of the polytope, in particular to the facets of the polytope. So that's something that we'll we'll come back to at some point. So uh, what is what is a polyhedral norm? So for our purpose, we're going to be we're going to be looking at centrally symmetric, uh, con you know, polytopes. But you, your starting point can be any centrally symmetric convex body. All you have to demand is for uh, zero to lie in the interior, so that the distance function is sort of defined everywhere and not just on like some 
lower dimensional affine space. And uh, you have, a, so you begin with a centrally symmetric convex body with zero in its interior. And you, you define this distance function in this following way. You say that the distance between two points A and B is the smallest scaling factor by which you need to blow up the point, the, the, uh, like, uh, the body centered at A in order to reach B. So in this picture, I have two points A and B. I have this hexagon, which is, uh, which is my body P. And the, and the distance from A and B in the, under this hexagonal norm is just the smallest scaling factor by which I need to blow up the body in order for B to be exactly contained in its boundary. So the smallest scaling factor for which this holds. Equivalently, I could have written uh, such that B minus A lies in alpha of boundary of B because it's because I want I want it to lie um, I want the smallest such scale. So so yeah so so with respect to the uh, this hexagonal norm, the distance between these two points will be designated alpha, and uh, that's sort of the starting point uh, for this uh, study is to sort of tease out properties of this uh, of this function dist p, you know, is it, so, so one thing that it, it will always be is that uh, it has like the usual characterizing properties of a norm. That is, when A equals B, it's zero. Uh, it's non-negative otherwise. Uh, when, uh, when you swap the slots of A and B, when you do dist B A, that's going to be the same as dist A B, and that comes from the central symmetry of the convex body. And the third thing is, that this will satisfy a triangle type inequality, in fact, exactly the triangle inequality, and that comes from the convexity of the body. Uh, so these three things uh, are in correspondence with each other, and dist AB, uh, or rather dist P zero dot is an honest norm, and then that's what we call a polyhedral norm, um, a norm that arises from a centrally symmetric point. Are there any questions so far? Okay, so in so so the main the main object of our study is the bisector. Uh, we fix two points A and B, and we want to study just the bisector of A and B, which is exactly what you think it is, just the locus of all points which are equidistant uh, from A and B. And remember, it doesn't matter whether I do A X or X A because of, of the central symmetry. So in the picture, in the in the image on your screen right here, um, the the bisector with respect to A and B consists of these one, two, three, four, five lines. This, this union of five lines, which intersect nicely. We'll come back to that in a second. And uh, this red, this red dot lies on, uh, like lies in the bisector because the exact scaling factor by which I need to uh, blow up the hexagon for it to simultaneously contain A and B uh, is the same. So the the same scaling factor by which it uh, I need to blow it up for it to contain A is the same as that that which it contains B. Um, so so, so that, that's the purpose of this image out here. It's, 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 it's not immediately clear how you get these turning points, how you get these one, two, three, four points at which uh, the line changes direction. Uh, I'm not gonna immediately, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna uh, sort of address the construction of these bisectors, uh, like, you know, sort of the, the way you construct it by hand, but rather I'm gonna talk about once we have them, what properties, uh, can we talk about and or really try and dive into the structural theory of, of these objects. Okay, so yeah, so that's what this image showcases. Um, uh, briefly, why why do these things matter? You know, in what context have do they have they arisen before and why would you sort of want to study them? How do they come up? So I talk about two two connections which um, which are of interest. One is the connection in convex geometry to, to Voronoi diagrams. So in a Voronoi diagram, you have a notion of distance, and if you have a finite set of points, and a Voronoi diagram is a subdivision of your uh, space uh, of Rd uh, into these regions, where in each region, your any point out here, like the cursor, is closer to the like the some element of this finite point set than it is to any to any other member. So if I'm in this left region out here, I'm closer to x1 than I am to x2, x3, x4. When I'm in x2, uh, I'm closer to x2 and so on. So, uh, and this is, so I've drawn this with respect to the Euclidean norm, with respect to the usual notion of distance. 
but uh, you could you could play this game just as easily with any polyhedral knob. And then if you take adjacent Voronoi isosceles, you know two things which are adjacent to each other, then uh, they intersect exactly in in the bisector. So the the intersection of two adjacent cells is contained in the bisector. So uh, part of the reason of studying you know uh, bisectors is the connection to Voronoi diagrams, and these diagrams. Uh, and the notion of you know Voronoi distance, you know Voronoi cells and um, their complexity, their characterization, they arise in uh, computational topology and robotics and uh, computer science and uh, and other such things. Uh, it's often of interest to uh, yeah to to count the number of of these maximal cells. So out here we got one, two, three, four, and um, yeah, so that's the connection to to Voronoi time. Now, in a different direction, there's a there's a there's a connection to algebraic statistics, which I'll sort of briefly dwell on. Um, so over here, over here, the starting point is that you have some metric on the finite set n. N over here just means one to up to n, and uh, this and this metric on n induces a notion of distance on on the entire space by uh, by the same by the same uh, by the same construction explained earlier, where this metric D is associated with this polytope BD, where I take all these EI minus EJs, like just the type A roots, I scale them by one over DIJ, and then I take the convex hull of that. So that gives rise to this polytope BD. And uh, this Wasserstein distance with respect to D is, uh, is precisely this distance function that I explained earlier, where the underlying polytope is B. So, so what's a, what's a, what's one central problem in, in algebraic statistics, or what's maybe one uh, one idea that's that's sort of recurrent, is that suppose you had samples x one up to x capital N out here, and you had some finite model um, that these uh, consisting of probability probability distributions mu one up to mu k, you want to ask which mu i best represents the sample, so which mu i best captures the, like, you know, some properties of the sample. And so one way to do that, one way to sort of, uh, yeah, to one perspective on this would be to sort of minimize the distance between the so-called empirical distribution, which is this thing out here, uh, this, this normalized sum of uh, the, these Dirac measures rooted at xj, and minimize the distance between that thing to to the mu i's, and because of uh, this piecewise linearity out here, taking this minimization is the same as uh, setting up a linear program. So that's what LP stands for out here. We're solving this linear program, and uh, that can be done through standard techniques, and often. Uh, the, so then, as soon as you set up a linear program, the you know the feasible region is of is is of some interest, and for our purposes out here, if k is two, so if we're choosing just between two probability distributions, then this decision boundary by which I mean the point at which uh, they are equal, uh, equals exactly the bisector of these two points mu one and mu two with respect to with respect to w. So that's how they arise out there. That's this is the fundamental in algebraic statistics, fundamental problem in, in algebraic statistics, and that's why they sort of matter. Yeah, so this is the big question we have really, which is uh, you know what the definition of the bisector is. What can be said about it in terms of any of these perspectives? The geometric one, the combinatorial one, the metric one, the set theoretic one. So towards that answer, there have been ad hoc answers given over the years that are maybe dependent on. Uh, two dimensions, three dimensions, and so on. So the first sort of systematic answer was given uh, fairly recently, and that's uh, and and that's and the, and the key tool here was to note that the bisector forms a polyhedral complex, and that's really that's one takeaway of this entire thing is that for two fixed points A and B, the bisector is a polyhedral complex, and these maximal cells are given precisely by the bisector intersected with facet cones that have been shifted appropriately so that the apex occurs at A and the, and the apex occurs at B. So rather than sort of reading this out to you, I'm going to give you an example shortly. And 
uh, the maximal cells are uh, all all polyhedra of this form as you vary through the facets f and g of p. And over here, cf, like I've said, is just the cone over the facet f. All right, and and well, as for for a proof for a proof of this one one important property of this this p that maybe I didn't mention is that uh, not only does it have these three characterizing properties of a norm, but it's also piecewise linear. So it's actually, it's, it, it's sort of very easy to write down in certain cases. Uh, just think of say the taxi cab norm. Um, so it's piecewise linear and what are the regions of linearity? The re regions of linearity are precisely sets of the form CF. So that's, this is essentially the fact that uh, underpins this theorem out here uh, that it, 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 that sort of gives you the, this idea that uh, when when two such cells intersect, uh, then this intersection is a face of both of them. You know, the defining property of a polyhedral complex. Right, and we sort of we sort of knew that already uh, by say looking at a picture like this, right, where if you have these one, two, three, four, five uh, lines, then uh, these two pieces intersect at this vertex, these two intersect at this vertex, essentially that the blue line forms a polyhedral complex. Okay. So, uh, so one, one thing that was uh, a focus of ours was to, was, to, was to try and answer the question, okay, this is a polyhedral complex. What can we say about the maximal cells? In particular, which maximal cells turn up? Can we characterize when they turn up? Um, can we characterize the number of maximal cells? And questions of this form. Okay, so, so one thing, um, so what two results that, uh, you know, that the uh, that previous work established was, uh, was sort of confirming our intuition of the two dimensional picture, which is namely that if you choose AB sufficiently, you know, randomly, then the bisectors is gonna be homeomorphic to Euclidean space which again, we can see out here by noting that, you know, the bisector of these two points is this, this line, right? So it's, it's something homeomorphic to a line. And, uh, and then, well, in a slightly stronger assumption, uh, the bisector is gonna be a pure polyhedral complex of dimension D minus one. So the idea out there is that over here, this is something that's not pure, right? because you have a maximal cell of uh, dimension one and two maximal cells of dimension two, and this is not con fully contained in either of them. So this is not pure. So this is a case of A, a and B not being in weak general position. I, I don't explain what strong general position is. That's a bit of a technicality, but in weak general position, it just means that uh, A and B are not parallel. The line through them is not parallel to any facet uh, of the point over here. Clearly, the line through A and B is parallel to a facet. It's parallel to this facet, so that causes the uh, the appearance of these two-dimensional cells. Right. So that gives us a sort of sort of topological picture of what this bisector looks like. Um, it's a pure polyhedral complex when A and B are uh, you know are, are picked sufficiently randomly, and it's homeomorphic to R D minus one in a in a slightly weaker assumption. Uh, but and we wanted to sort of ask sort of combinatorial questions about this polyhedral complex. Okay, but first let me let me quickly demonstrate the polyhedrality. Um, so this is the bisector, the blue line out here, and uh, I want to identify this uh, this portion of the bisector and th this right hand side portion of the bisector, and I want to I and I the the Idea is that it's associated precisely to two facets, which and which are those? It's one and four, because if you intersect, uh, if you intersect the blue line with these facet cones with uh, C four plus A, which is just uh, you know these dotted lines and these dotted lines, so the, the the sort of quadrant generated by this ray and this ray, together with the one generated by this ray and that ray. So these two facet cones with apex zero and A respectively, then you get this light purple region out here in which the bisectors contain. So essentially each maximal cell corresponds to uh, this labeled pair of bisectors. Like it, you can identify it by a pair of bisectors. Uh, 
so so those are the maximal cells but of course you have you know you have four facets out here so you have four squared 16 possible choices of uh, of of you know of labels but only three show up so we want to know that we want to ask the question you know given a pair of facets given a pair of facets fg uh, when does this this sub fg 0a actually show up in the bisector because over here only 2 3 1 4 and whatever this one is uh, turns up, right? So we want to ask the question, when do these maximal cells um, actually make an appearance in the bisector? Right, and uh, well, over here, this is this is another picture to demonstrate this polyhedrality, uh, these pieces intersecting nicely. And uh, similarly over here, this is the, the, the two-dimensional picture we saw earlier for the taxi cab case, which is applied to the hexagonal norm. Again, it's a difference between um, lying in weak general position because the line through AB isn't parallel to any facet out here, but it is out here. So that creates the, the presence of these uh, two-dimensional cells. Right, so we wanna ask the questions, uh, the, the question as to which maximal cell shows up. And the first thing to do is to sort of uh, gather it was to fix two facets FG and to and to sort of find out uh, for for which uh, A is this cell non-empty? Is this polyhedron actually non-empty? So we do something that might be uh, fairly intuitive: is we, we collect all such A and we study this collection uh, as a polyhedral cone. So we dub this the bisection cone of F and G and we want to sort of study the polyhedral properties of this cone. So if it's, and it turns out to indeed be a polyhedral cone. So we want to find things like, you know, does it have a nice facet description? The answer is no. Does it have a nice ray description? The answer is yes. And what else can it be used? And how can we use this to sort of relate it to known quantities in polytope theory? Like it turns out to have a connection to, you know, the tangent cones, uh, a tangent cone of a, of a face of a polytope and, and other things. So, uh, the bisection cones out here turn out to be building blocks of the bisection fan that's in the title of this uh, talk. And uh, so, yeah, so this is a little bit about about, the, about this bisection cone, that you sort of take all these A for which uh, this maximal cell is non-empty, that turns out to be a polyhedral cone. And it has a very nice ray description. So the ray description is, is sort of neat. And that says that the, that, each such bisection cone is generated by all vectors of the form V minus U, where V is a vertex of this facet of the facet F and U is a vertex of the facet G. And uh, so it's, it's this sort of conical hull of, of these things. You might wonder how, I mean, how do you exactly produce this? It's sort of like a rabbit produced from a hat. There's no exact explanation. So the truth is that we already had a, uh, an expression for it in terms of this, this is a bit of a mouthful to say, but I'll say it anyway, is that you take uh, these facets uh, F and G, you homogenize them, which is to say that you uh, insert them into one dimension higher, but at height one, and then you take the Minkowski sum of these homogenizations, and then you take the slice of that Minkowski sum, where you're slicing it with the hyperplane last coordinate equal to zero. So that might not be terribly intuitive, but it's from that description that we obtain this um, this ray description, and and yeah, and these things uh, turn out to be uh, the building blocks of this bisection fan. I'm going to have a picture of this somewhere later on, uh, so as to sort of confirm one's intuition about how, how they subdivide uh, the polytope. Right, so we have a ray description, which is neat, and we have a facet description, which isn't particularly useful, except from a comp computational standpoint. And uh, at the end, if I have time, I'll do a computer demonstration to sort of plot all these bisection cones together, and it will look like something familiar, uh, or at the very least, we'll relate it to other known sort of polyhedral fans that we can create from a fixed polytope. Right. So in this particular case, in the two-dimensional case, we, we sort of want to know, uh, you know, which are the true generators? Because you have, two, you have two vertices out here, two vertices out here. 
So you have a choice of four possible rays, but of course only two are going to be the two rays. So we want to know what are the actual generators of this uh, of this bisection cone. And well, out here it has a simple combinatorial description. Uh, you have your you know this this dot this diagonal represents v one minus v five. This is v ten minus v four, and the two parallel. I mean, are they parallel? No, no, not quite. I mean. I mean, it doesn't matter either way, but V10 minus V5 and V1 minus V4 uh, represent the, the other two things out here. And the it's the diagonals that are going to be the generators because if you plot them, uh, the diagonals are going to be the ones that subtend the least, I mean, yeah, the least and the greatest angles with uh, the positive, uh, with, yeah, with, the, with the positive x-axis. So I plotted these out here. You take these and transpose them to this authent, and uh, the two, the sort of the two straight lines out here, the two uh, sides of this quadrilateral are contained strictly in this uh, in the cone generated by the diagonals. So the bisection cones out here are concrete; they're easily visualizable, um, and that's yeah, and that's one of the things that we were able to show. But really, we want to we want to find a notion that you know that overcomes the dependence of um, the the bisector on the relative positions of a and b, which is to say that in any of these pictures that you saw, uh, like say this one, uh, say if I if I shifted this b slightly up so that it lay on this line that is parallel to this edge, then I suddenly have the formation of these two. Uh, of these two max to these two two dimensional cells, so I want to impose a notion of equivalence on these bisectors that sort of captures the sensitivity of, yeah, the like the presence of each maximal cell to the relative positions of A and B. And one way to do that is to is to introduce an equivalence relation. So over here, I introduce an equivalence relation on these bisectors where I identify the bisectors by their corresponding maximal cells being simultaneously non-empty or empty. And remember, the, the, these maximal cells are indexed by uh, pairs of facets of the polytope. So what I'm really asking for is that I'll say two bisectors are equivalent. If the same set of facet labels, if, the, if a set of facet labels that turns up for uh, one bisector is the same as the ones that turn up for the other bisector. That's the notion of equivalence. Uh, that we're working with out here. So, so formally, formally, if we have four points, A, B, A prime, and B prime, we declare this bisector to be equivalent to this other one. If for all choices of facets, the non-emptiness of this maximal cell coincides with the non-emptiness of this maximal cell, which is to say that there's some point that lies in this maximal cell, if and only if there's one there, there's one that's out here. This could be one dimensional and this could be two dimensional. That's fine. So it's a notion that's, you know, it's weaker than that of, uh, you know, uh, affinely isomorphic uh, polyhedral complexes. All we're asking for is this simultaneous emptiness and non-emptiness of, uh, of maximal cells. So we have an equivalence relation. Um, so we extend that to, you know, an equivalence relation on, on points, on points in RD. So we subdivide the space, the underlying space RD, um, into these equivalence classes, where these equivalence classes are generated by this equivalence relation, that A is related to B if this bisector is equivalent to this bisector under this notion of equivalence. So now the, what follows, it's slightly uh, technical and wordy and uh, not exactly intuitive. We'll get to the pictures slightly later, but I'm just gonna, you know, disentangle what exactly uh, it means to uh, it, to be equivalent like this. So, so out here, it just means that if A relates to B, then for every pair of facets Fg of P, we have A lies in this bisection cone, if and only if B lies in this bisection cone. So uh, A, relate, A is related to B, if and only if you have this simultaneous membership or simultaneous non-membership in this bisection cone. And uh, this simultaneous membership should occur for all pairs of facets. Okay. So, okay, so we have this equivalence relation. We want to 
tease out what the equivalence classes are. So the equivalence classes are just sets that are going to be of this form. So of there, there's going to be some portion that's made up of all the things that are uh, that where there is simultaneous membership, and it's going to have this portion which is all the things where there's simultaneous non-membership. So formally, it's this intersection of bisection cones uh, indexed by some set, uh, where this set is a subset of the set of pairs of facets because uh, that's what uh, index these bisection cones. So some subset of the fair pairs of facets, you intersect over them. And then you also intersect with the complementary set out here. Okay. And uh, that captures, and I mean, that is the equivalence class induced by this equivalence relation. And now the goal is to ask what, what kind of properties do we have for this ES? Can we say anything about the topological properties? Do we, can we say anything about the polyhedral properties? Maybe one thing that could be seen is that uh, if you take this set, and you remember, you can't even tell if it's actually open or closed out here because this bit is uh, closed because it's it's an intersection of closed sets and this bit is open, it's an intersection of open sets. But you can't actually tell what happens um, uh, when you intersect these two paths together. But if you take the closure of this ES, um, you can see that it forms a star convex set. And when a star convex set is one in which uh, it contains the origin, and if you have to take any other point x, the line joining zero to x uh, is completely contained in that set. So that is one thing that hints towards this ES being convex in general, and it is, uh, I mean, sorry, it's not convex in general, in fact, because we don't know that, uh, yeah, we don't know that these equivalence classes have these nice properties in general. We would like to show that, but at this point, we don't have that. But we want to we want to know what kind of polyhedral properties ES has. Is it convex? If it's convex, does it form a, a cone? And then taking these all these ESs together, all these sets of the form ES, uh, do they form a fan? Because that's the nicest kind of question that we could, um, nicest kind of uh, conclusion that we could hope for. And that was shown to be the case when P is this uh, polytope out here, this thing called the tropical unit ball which is to say that it's the unit ball under, under the tropical metric. And uh, I won't get into the definition of the tropical metric. Uh, a few slides uh, ahead, I'll have like a picture of what, it, what's, what the pictures look like in the case of B3 and B4. But when these three authors were studying, uh, you know, algorithmic and sort of combinatorial properties of the bisector, one thing that they were able to show along the way was that uh, that the collection of these cones, I mean, of these, yeah, these sets, yes, I mean, they do, they are cones. Um, they they form they form a polyhedral fan, and that's that's our goal as well. We want to see, we want to ask for what other, uh, you know, convex bodies p for what other polytopes p. Is it true that these ESs form a fan? That sort of argument. So uh, to that end, we have this description of uh, this formal definition of this thing. So we say that you know when when these ESs form when this collection forms a polyhedral fan that fan is what we dub the bisection fan. So that the way we define it is slightly indirect and it's again it's a, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's it's stuff that I've sort of already explained on the preceding slides. Uh, we 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 have a polytope and we have something that we want that we're positing is a polyhedral fan. This positing is a is a bisection fan. So we say that this delta is a bisection fan if and only if these two conditions um, are equivalent. And the first is that uh, when you have that, the first is this, this, this normal equivalence, this equivalence of A, A and, A and B under the equivalence relation mentioned before. And the second is that A and B lie in the same, uh, the interior of the same maximal cone of this fan. So it basically says that if this bisection fan exists, it captures the polyhedrality of the sets ES it captures the fact that each ES is a maximal cone and that uh, when you're in the interior of, uh, of, of this cone, then you're equivalent to everything. And when you when you would take two points that lie on opposite sides of some hyperplane, then, um, then this equivalence breaks. Then you don't have uh, equivalence between the A and B. So that means that you will have some facet label that turns up in one that isn't present in the other. Okay, are there any questions about this? Any questions about the bisection fan?
Okay, so uh, so so this is the this is the main object that uh, they introduced, and we wanted to sort of establish in sort of a few a few other cases, and uh, well, they were able to do this in this case of this topical unit ball, and this topical unit ball looks like this. Uh, it's this intersection of for all, you know all points in this thing called uh, this. Uh, what is this called? Is it the tropical torus? I forget the name for this, but um, the yeah, the set of all points out here for which x i minus x j is less than or equal to one, and uh, these are the sort of uh, this is the sort of inequality description of this polytope, and in so b two looks like this and b three looks like this, which is a, a rhombic dodecahedron, and th in this case they were able to show that uh, that this this bisection fan exists, and the 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 question of existence it, it isn't obvious that they they all exist in fact i'm not sure if they all if if it exists for every centrally symmetric point it would certainly be nice but uh, i'm not sure if that's true i'm not sure if that's true even in dimensions 3 but we were able to show that it that it is true in certain in a few certain cases and uh, those are well the dimension 2 case which is which is good um the the cross polytopal case uh then the dual case, which is the, uh, the the case of hypercubes, and finally it's the symmetric edge polytopes of the complete graph K D, which it turns out is the polar dual of this thing out here. So we we, we were able to extend this sort of existence theorem of this bisection fan uh, to these four X star cases, and the proof strategy out there was um, there's nothing really that unified these cases. So there's nothing really that you could use across these cases, but it it relied on explicitly computing an inequality description of the bisection cones, and then um, sort of making an educated guess as to what uh, the bisection fan could be, and then proving that it, that was indeed the case. So yeah, so they they were able to show that uh, this bisection fan exists. They had this ex very explicit combinatorial description of it. It's called the, the fan of bisected ordered partitions. Um, the definition is a little involved, so I won't get into it. But uh, yeah, the main the main takeaway out here is that we were sort of able to extend this existence theorem of bisection fans to these other cases. Uh, so, so a few pictures now to to clarify this because it might have it might have been a little um, sort of lacking in motivation. So, in this two dimensional case, in this case of the bisection fan of polygons. Uh, the truth is that the bisection fan we get is just the bisection fan where you have rays of this form vi minus vj for every i and j. So, which is to say that it looks something like this. So, you have this is your, uh, you know, v1 minus v6, this is v1 minus v2, and so on. You go in this order and you get uh, all possible, all possible um, combination of vi minus vjs form these rays. So, that is perhaps expected, that isn't terribly uh, informative, but at least in the two-dimensional case, they exist. Um, the bisection fan exists, right. So if this, if this idea of this bisection fan was of any use, it should have like an explicit meaning. It should have a kind of combinatorial uh, consequence. It should have an idea of uh, essentially what it encodes. So the idea is that each, I mean, you, I told you that each um, each maximal cone is an equivalence class and every equivalence class is a maximal cone. But how do these things, you know, sort of visually change? Like if I, imagine I had uh, the case of a two-dimensional cross polytope and uh, I told you that from the theorem before, v1 minus v3 is a ray, v1 minus v2 is a ray, v4 minus v2 is a ray, v4 minus v1 is a ray, and this is also a ray. So we have four maximal cones out here, one, two, three, and four. And suppose uh, I picked one point in each of them, and then I wanted to ask, uh, you know, how does a bisection fan of 0a1 look different from the bisection fan of 0a2? The truth is that they're all going to look the same topologically, but what will differ is that they'll all have a set of distinct uh, maximal cell labels. 
So the set of labels that appear on the bisector with respect to 0 and A1 is going to be different from that of 0 and A2, and so on, and so on. So that's essentially what this bisection fan encodes, and that's that's what I've drawn out here. Is that so in the case of 0 A1, you have the labels 2, 3. So wait, sorry, uh, I, I did the labeling in this in this count counterclockwise order. So this is one, this is two, this is three, and this is four. So for zero and A1, I, I have the unit ball around zero, the unit ball around A1, and the leftmost part is the bisection. It, it corresponds to the cell two, three, since it, it corresponds to taking the cone over this thing, over this, which is two, and over this, which is three. Um, this middle part corresponds to the number, the, 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 the cell, you know, the label one, three, and this corresponds to one, four. So we have two, three, one, three, and one, four. And out here, you, we have one, two, one, three, and four, three. So these, these labels change slightly when I, when I change the point, when I vary the point to be, to be this thing, A2 out here. So the same happens when we vary it to A3, where we have one, two, four, two, and four, three. And finally, when we have A4, we find we also vary it, we get three, two, four, two, and four, one. So the these labels, I mean, this, this might be like a visual overload, but uh, it's all of this is just to say that the set of labels changes as we change the points. And what's, what mattered was that each point was representative of each maximal cone of each equivalence class. So that's really what the bisection fan uh, uh, encodes. Question. The, yes. Are you just picking different points around like a center point? Is that what you... Is that what A2, A3, and A4 are? Or can you say again where they're coming from? Yeah, so I choose... Uh, I Oh, they're those points. They're points that are just representatives of each maximal okay. cone. So they're just points gotcha. chosen from okay. this, 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 and this. And the point is that they just... Uh, that Yeah, that, they that the set of labels varies. Um, and the point of variation is this, this idea that... Um, yeah, that the equivalence is... That you're only equivalent if you're if I, if a two was in this cone, then the labels that show up would be the same, but they're not. So, uh, it's yeah, it's really that uh, this this membership in the bisection cone that that's the key idea. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Sure. So um. Yeah. So we've introduced this object. We've constructed this polyhedral fan. It's bisect. We call it the bisection fan. And so that we have some better intuition about, you know, what it looks like uh, and where it might turn up or how you might construct it, um, how you might relate it to other fans, uh, it makes sense to talk about, you know, some known sort of fans that arise from uh, fixed polytopes. So of course, one is a face fan, the other is like the normal fan. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to talk about at least one other that, uh, that, that you would have definitely seen before. So... I didn't really tell you what the bisection fans look like in the cross polytope cube and KD case, but in the case of the cross polytope case, they they are the fans that are induced by hyperplane arrangements. So you have some hyperplane arrangement, and the maximal cells are chambers in these arrangements. Maximal cones are chambers in these arrangements. So that happens to be the case for polygons and cross polytopes, but uh, that isn't the case for the cube. So it, it doesn't arise from hyperplane arrangement. And the case of the symmetric edge polytope um, is even more complicated. The proof was fairly ad hoc and uh, it had, yeah, again, no, no relation to any of the other cases. Uh, it was just uh, quite case-wise ad hoc um, and it's fairly detail-oriented. And there's not, there wouldn't be much, uh, yeah, much in the way of explanation if I, if I, even if I showed you a picture. So, so with respect to other fans, uh suppose um so i, I want to relate uh the bisection fan with respect to these fans in particular uh, uh, sorry fp and hp out here where fp is just the face fan so imagine we had the case of the cube the face fan are just these pyramids out here one two three four uh five and six five and six like the front facing and the back facing face and uh gp is uh, this fan induced by the hyperplane arrangement HP, with HP is this, uh, imagine taking each of the facet hyperplanes of the polytope 
and pushing them through so that they contain, pushing them through parallelly so that they contain the origin. And then that hyperplane arrangement will be essential. It, it contains only the origin. And the and that induces a fan. So let HP be that fan that, that gets induced. So this is this GP. See? I took the facets of the uh, of the cube and I pushed them in, up, and you know, like that. And it creates these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, octants. Uh, they these eight sort of, um, yeah, octants up. And uh, and then I want to relate the bisection fan to, to each of these guys. And the way that we do that is uh, through the relation of um, refinement, or rather common refinement of two fans. So again, FP is the face fan, GP is this facet hyperplane arrangement, and HP is the fan induced by that. So then one of the results that we have is that uh, if, if you have a centrally symmetric polytope P, uh, and it admits a bisection fan, then uh, this bisection fan delta, it refines both FP and HP. And I'll, uh, in a demonstration that I'll do momentarily, I'll tell you, uh, I'll show you the, how I can, you can sort of visually see how it refines both of these. And if you've not seen like, like refinement between polyhedral fans before, it just means that every cone out here is contained in a cone out here. And every cone out here is contained in a cone of this hyperplane arrangement HP. And based off the observation that in the case of the cubes and the cross polytopes, not only does it refine them both, it's equal to the common refinement of them both, which, which, which means that there's nothing else, which means that the refinement also goes the other way, or rather the containment also goes the other way. That uh, the common refinement of these two fans uh, is exactly equal to the bisection fan. So then one question that you might be led to ask is that uh, what are necessary or sufficient criteria on the polytope in order to uh, in order to always have this conclusion, in order to always have that, uh, the bisection fan being exactly equal to this common refinement? Right, so I don't think uh, we have too much time left. So in what follows, I just wanted to do a quick computer demonstration. Uh, so the first thing that I'll do is to show you uh, what the bisection fan uh, looks like for some case that we that we know you know the bisection fan exists, and for the other case, maybe choose your favorite uh, centrally symmetric polytope in dimensions two and three, and uh, and well give it to me, and then we can sort of look at what the picture looks like together. So let me stop. Uh, with this uh with with the slides out here let me let me transfer to wait can you see my terminal yeah no oh um, wait we can see your not terminal yes we can see the pdf but not yeah we're not the looking terminal. at okay, adobe wait. do i need to uh stop sharing and then yeah you might have to again? change what you're sharing cool cool let me just do that in a second Okay, can you see this now? Yes. Right, so uh, I'm gonna do this in polymic. So suppose I had uh, a cube and uh, this script out here just, it sort of does this simultaneous plotting of all the bisection cones. So you remember the definition of, of the bisection cone. Uh, it just plots them all simultaneously. And it'll look something like this. All right, the screen sharing is paused. Um, hold on, let me. So let me share my. Screen again. I don't know. Mm. All right. Can you see this? Yes. So hopefully out here you'll be able to see if you can remember the picture that we had uh, a few minutes ago of the face fan and the fan that I called HP. 
hopefully you can see how this fan out here uh, refines that because each cone out here is clearly contained in the pyramidal cone and each cone out here is also contained in the cone that is generated by you know those uh, these chambers so that's essentially uh, a demonstration of this refinement and uh, you can do all sorts of fun things in polymake like make it explode and stuff like that but um, that's not maybe terribly relevant so uh, in the few minutes that remained um, and well if i can do it uh, why don't you name a centrally symmetric polytope anybody name a centrally symmetric polytope and we can let's see if we can plot this um, together so what's a centrally symmetric polytope that you like something that's that's sort of not too wacky anybody give us some multiple choice options multiple choice options okay uh maybe octahedron uh, is that okay sure okay sure what about the octahedron all right um oh wait let me just okay hopefully this is well behaved um and it doesn't just copy the old image but Sorry, I clearly haven't uh, chosen this, the share option where I can share everything, but um, this is what it looks like. So out here you have the octahedron and with this subdivision of its boundary as indicated. And it might not mean much. I mean, it might not be clearly, might not be clear you know, what this means, but if you can imagine the face fan of the octahedron, and you can imagine the fan that I called HP, then once again, if I've done this kind of transparency enough, you should be able to see how um, the bisection fan out here, which are basically intersected with the polytope, uh, how that refines each of those fans that I was talking about. But all right, I guess I'm kind of out of time, so I'll wrap this up. Um, Let's thank our speaker. So, wait, uh, are you not actually? Done? Oh no, I'm. I just, I just have, I just have a last slide left. But yeah, I'll, I'll run through this um, quickly. Uh, so yeah, I, I just wanted to say that. Uh, so we, uh, we looked at these bisectors of this of centrally symmetric polytopes. They turned out to be polyhedral complexes, and we were interested in determining which maximal cells turn up. We know that maximal cells were labeled by pairs of facets, and. Uh, we saw that if the bisection fan exists, then it encodes this equivalence class of bisectors. And this, where the equivalence relation, this identification is made by the simultaneous presence and absence of these labeled maxima cells. And then one of the results that we were able to show is that the bisection fan exists for these five classes. And a question that we probably want to answer in full generality is that do they always exist? Do they exist uh, regardless of uh, the centrally centri symmetric point of you start with? Is there some unified way in which you can show that they exist always? But uh, of independent interest are these bisection cones and they always exist. And like I said, they turn out to be these interesting refinements of tangent cones. In fact, I can show you can show that, that a tangent cone is always uh, can be written as this union of bisection cones. It can always be decomposed in this as this union of bisection cones, which sort of has interesting connections to these, um, you know, this Briand cone gram type uh, identities that turn up in polyhedral geometry. And finally, uh, here's a link to uh, the code if you want to play around with play around with it yourself. That's a link to my GitHub, and um, that's it. That's pretty much it. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your attention. Let's thank our speaker. <laughs>
Thank you. Sure. Are there other questions for our speaker? I guess I have one, um, which is, so you, you told us about the bisection fans of different classes of centrally symmetric polytopes. What happens if your polytope is not centrally symmetric? That's a, yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. So the, the truth is that you can come up with an analogous theory of bisectors. So mm -hmm. as far as how much does a central symmetry affect the, affect the theory, the one reason why we chose that was because, uh, I, I mean, there's an aesthetically pleasing amount, uh, like angle to the centrally symmetric polytopes. Uh, the second is that you won't be able to have results like um, the refinement result, because the refinement result essentially relies on um, the fact that I mean, we, you saw those bisection cones, right? They're parameterized by two facets, F and G. So if 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 you can't, and the bisection fan of F and minus F turns out to just be the cone over the facet F. So I didn't uh, I didn't I didn't write that as a as a result, but that's true. So if you don't have uh, the cone over the facet F, that somehow interferes with um, yeah this refinement relation holding. So uh, you the short answer is that yes, you could uh, develop an anal analogous theory, but um, some results would fail, and one of this, one of these is this, is this result in these refinements. But in, in that way, there's one thing that's that's worth mentioning. So in the two-dimensional case, you saw that uh, when the two-dimensional cells form, like those that ice cream cone shaped thing, you saw that there were always two two-dimensional cells, right? So if in the case of like this, the sort of one-sided theory of bisectors, if you didn't have central symmetry, then the truth is. Yeah. So then, then the the result you'd get is that uh, then the number of uh, two dimensional cells that turn up uh, is equal to the yeah the number of sides that the line is parallel to. So if you have like uh, central symmetry, then the line joining A and B will always be parallel to two things. But if you don't have central symmetry, then it's possible that only one two dimensional cell will turn up. Only one uh, ice cream cone shaped cell will turn up. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Sure. I had a question had a about. Question. Oh, I got one. Yeah. Sure. I had a question about the connection to algebraic statistics primarily. Um, sure. Something sure. I, um, how deep does that? I, don't, I guess it's a two-parter. Uh, how deep does that connection go, to your knowledge? Uh, in terms of analyzing some statistical features, and have you yourself done any work studying the interplay between the two? Okay, I'll answer the easier part first. I've not done any work analyzing the interplay between the two, and I've not. Uh, I'm I'm not really in algebraic statistics, and uh, I know of this connection through, uh, yeah, through work in maybe algebraic geometry and polyhedral geometry done in sort of analyzing uh, the sort of feasible regions of that linear program that I talked about. And uh, mm -hmm. sort of trying to say something about, uh, uh, yeah, approaching this thing from a from the point of view of minimizing this Wasserstein distance. But uh, so you said, how does it how did it arise, right? What was that the first part of your question, or? Or how deep does the connection go? But sure. How deep does the connection go? Okay, right. Um, you can end the like how so. how deep does the analogy go? That's that's good. No, wait. The the, the bridge is strong. That you can in fact derive, uh, you know, say quite a few things about. Uh, the like the problem in algebraic statistics by looking at um by looking at these objects from from a polyhedral geometric point of things of course there's a vast simplification right we 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 did this thing for just uh, for just two um for just two distributions right because you said that the decision decision boundary uh, then corresponds to yeah the case for just two so you can come up with an analogous theory for bisectors of any finite point set it doesn't have to just be two and that is really where uh that deepens the connection between algebraic statistics and um, and polyhedral geometry. Uh, I'm not the best person to ask about these, but I have a few references that I could send you if you're interested in this, or if you're an algebraic statistics person, in which case you, probably, you might probably already know more than me. I'm not, but I, I work at the intersection of algebraic geometry and machine learning nowadays, which has a pretty, not too, something you, something you mentioned about the Wasserstein distance, 
uh, seem pretty related to some work I've done with analyzing like uh, converging regions and like neural networks. And right. a lot of and a lot of times you can analyze those by representing them as a polytope, representing the network as a polytope, and right. then doing networks on the polytope, and that could tell you something about the feasibility region, or they call it a linear region in the ML community. Right, right, right. right. Uh, I was seemed like it'd be a nice, neat analog to something I was doing. Right. Well, uh, again, like I said, I don't, I don't know the the theory that deeply myself, but. I know, uh, I know of at least two references that are both readable and that you would find interesting. Lots of pictures, so uh, I don't know if you give me if you can give me your email ID, I can. I'd be happy to send those um, those references. Right. Other questions? Let's thank our speaker one more time. We'll end our recording.